We're getting you ready for another Syracuse football matchup. Greg Medea is here with, from the Daily Progress with us to break down Virginia. It's all on Locked On Syracuse. It's right now. Our Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Matt Bonaparte and Valentine with you on your Thursday episode of Locked On Syracuse. Thanks for making Locked On Syracuse your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Greg Medea from the Daily Progress. Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, Matt Owen. Good to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, we're talking Syracuse, Virginia. This comes out Thursday morning. So tomorrow night inside the Dome, some Friday night lights for the Orange and Cavs. Pretty exciting one, although it hasn't been the smoothest of sailing for Virginia so far this season. Two and one, but a loss to Illinois on the road. You saw former Syracuse quarterback Tommy DeVito in that one. Illini put up 24, Cavs put up three. I've been, you know, we, we did some research yesterday. We did a bit of a Virginia preview episode. Uh, and the question I think everybody has regarding Syracuse and Virginia right now, because it's the biggest talking point between the two teams, are how Robert and I and Jason Beck jumped ship from the Wahoos to the Orange. How much of a difference do you think they've made in their wake? Yeah, I, I think they've, they've, they've done a good job at Syracuse, right? I mean, you look at... What Robert and I was last year at Virginia, UVA was like 62% throw with Brennan Armstrong and those receivers, uh, Dontavian Wicks, Keaton Thompson. They had a tight end, Jelani Woods, too, who's now with the Indianapolis Colts. And now you look at what he's done at Syracuse through the first three weeks, and the Orange are like 60% run. So he's yeah. totally flipped his tendencies, and you've seen his ability to adjust to his personnel. I was looking at it closely on Tuesday, and – that's the highest run rate he's had since like 2018 when we when Virginia had an 1000 yard rusher at running back and a 900 yard rusher at quarterback. So he's clearly got an eye and an ability to assess the talent that's at his disposal and use it. And I think there's a lot of credit there because you got some coaches who get stuck in the mud with with what they think should work, right? So I think that's what what stands out. On the Virginia side, of course, there's been some adjustment since Tony Elliott coming in from Clemson uh, and, and Des Kitchings, the offensive coordinator. He was a running backs coach for the Falcons in the NFL last year, but before that was at NC State. The offense Virginia's running now, it's more structured. It's a little less freewheeling than, than what Robert and I let Brennan Armstrong do uh, a year ago when, when he was slinging a ball all over the yard to all the different receivers. So there's been a little bit of an adjustment there for Virginia's offense and you know, Kitchings, he, he, he said something interesting. I can't remember if it was earlier this week or, or after the game against Old Dominion. Like, the chemistry between Armstrong and his receivers is still there. Like, he can spot that. He can see that. That hasn't gone away. But what has happened is they're trying to adjust to this new offense. They're trying to see how everything times up and how it's supposed to look. So there's a lot of thinking going on. Uh, but – they saw some progress this past Saturday against Old Dominion, 500-plus yards of total offense. And really, if, if they hadn't fumbled three times inside Old Dominion territory, including twice in the red zone, the game probably wouldn't have been as close. I mean, you never know. But the game likely wouldn't have been as close as it was, and they probably wouldn't have needed a uh, game-winning field goal as time expired uh, to beat the Monarchs. Yeah, and when I when I look at this this Virginia team, obviously coming into the season, the the eyes go to Brennan Armstrong, and obviously coming off a almost forty five hundred passing yard season, thirty plus passing touchdowns, that is where your eyes go. But through the first couple of weeks, and you've had closer eyes on this, you know, me watching from afar, he doesn't quite look the same. He's still got those flashes. You know, he's really there. 
But what has sort of been that difference? I know you attributed a little bit a second ago to this new offense. Is there anything else that you've sort of seen out of him that has sort of led to, I don't want to call it a regression yet, but this sort of different look from afar? Yeah, uh, it's the offensive line. <laughs> uh, it's the offensive line pretty clearly. He got beat up at Illinois. I mean, hey, yeah. Illinois was in the backfield. It, it seemed like all afternoon, and it was not a good trip to Champaign for, for the Cavaliers. I mean, it, it, Illinois' front, it, not only were they – it seemed like they were stronger and bigger uh, than Virginia's offensive line. Virginia just had a hard time I, identifying and, and determining, you know, who to block, and I think that could be an issue – come Friday night against the Orange, which uh, who, who who really do show you a bunch of different looks and who can get you, you know, out of sync as an offensive line in terms of identifying protections and and moving in that direction. So I think that is a, is a big, big interesting point heading into this Friday night game is how does Virginia's offensive line, which was better uh, this past Saturday against Old Dominion, uh, only allowed two sacks compared to five the week before uh, out in Big Ten country, uh, I think that's that's going to be a huge part of this game because if Armstrong's under pressure, and there were times it was, you know, four or five step drops, and and somebody's already in his face, you can't have that. I mean, you just can't. You, no matter how good of a quarterback and, and and how creative you might be with trying to extend plays with your legs, and Armstrong can do that, you you have to have time to throw the football, especially when Virginia wants to take its shots down the field. You saw it early, I think, a little bit against Old Dominion, just to just to alleviate some of the pressure in the box, right? Virginia took two shots on the first two plays of the game, both to Dontavian Wicks, long throws. The passes fell incomplete, but all of a sudden Old Dominion couldn't just line up and, and, and say, you know, you're going to get after the quarterback. You're going to get after the running game. They had to uh, alleviate some of that pressure in the box and defend the passing game. So I would be surprised if Virginia doesn't take some shots early just to try to thin Syracuse out a little bit. Uh, because they, they've got to find ways to get Armstrong time. I want to stay with Armstrong just for a second. I feel like coming into the year, Armstrong, and, and still is, touted as one of the more talented quarterbacks that the ACC has to offer because he had such a good year last year and, and was really the, the beating heart of that offense. If they're going to succeed this year, that probably has to remain true. How confident are you in him to bring it back and be that good once again this season. Yeah, I think he can. As, as long as Virginia's O-line continues to progress in a in a right direction, I thought they were okay week one against FCS Richmond. I thought they were bad week two against Illinois. But then I thought they were much better this past Saturday against Old Dominion. Maybe some of that has to do with the return of Jonathan Leach, uh, their right tackle. He got hurt in training camp and then and missed the first – or didn't play the first week – dressed and only came in in reserve uh, the second week, but played and started uh, against against ODU, uh, I thought that maybe changed some things for their offensive line personnel-wise. They were starting a freshman uh, at, at left tackle before that. Uh, so to me, I think maybe there's some upgrades to be made there and they can get some chemistry and cohesion going to better protect Armstrong. But I think he's still got it. He, he's, he's the same – type of player can throw is you see the arm you see the arm strength you see you see the toughness when he takes off and runs with the football so I, I think I think he'll be okay long term gotcha you want to go I, ahead on yeah, yeah I just I, I look at and we you know we're talking right now about Brennan Armstrong struggles but now I'm about to say you know Virginia the only team in the ACC with three player three receivers in the top 16 in terms of receiving yards uh when you look at Keaton Thompson Dontavian Wicks and uh, Lavelle Davis what are sort of where you see their roles where might you know we see each of them sort of succeed uh and then I just you know I can't get over the 25 yards per catch still from you know Davis through eight receptions for 200 plus yards. So he seems like, you know, he can be a big play guy, but sort of when you look at that trio who have all had their own success this year, sort of where can we expect to, to see them in this game and their, their different roles as receivers here? Yeah. I, th I think Thompson, it's, it's more the middle of the field. I think he really has a knack for finding space within the defense, uh, you know, but be between the hashes and he can make tough catches. There's a play he made against Old Dominion in the second half the other day. You're just like, how the heck did he come up with that ball? So I think he he's very good uh, in traffic and in the middle of the field. 
Wicks, it's going to be your deep shots. It's going to be your your try to take the top off the defense, get him out, and get get him deep uh, because he he can absolutely get it. He's proven that in the past, and they had success with it last year. Uh, I think with Davis, he's so tall, six seven, that he's almost impossible to match up with. You can put him on a slant, and nobody's going to outstretch him for a pass. You can throw it to him on a fade. Uh, and, you know, toward the end zone if you're inside the red zone. And, and maybe you'll see more of that this week as uh, Virginia's red zone struggles and their turnovers uh, have, have really hurt them the first few weeks of the season. Uh, maybe you'll see some some chances for Davis in the end zone. Uh, I think that's a possibility. Uh, but his his ability to, to outleap and outstretch people make it really tough. It's like most cornerbacks aren't taller than 6'1", right? And then you're putting them against 6'7", and 6'7", that can jump and leap and and, and be strong. Uh, that That's that's very, very difficult. All right, let's take a quick break uh, to bring you some information about Nugenics. Remember when winning felt easy? That's because when you were younger, you were at the peak of your testosterone production, what some have called the winner's hormone or the man hormone. Wouldn't it be nice to get that winner's edge again and that old swagger back in your step? Want more energy to counter the negative physical effects of aging? Nugenics Total T Testosterone Booster with Testafin will help you turn back the clock, re-energize your workouts, get you better results at the gym, and help you look and feel like the man you really want to be. Nugenics Total T contains man-boosting key ingredients like testosterone. It has been validated in five clinical studies shown to boost free testosterone levels in men. Uh, and because Nugenics Total T boosts free testosterone that the aging process robs, you'll feel stronger, leaner with the more energy and drive and more passion too. Your partner will notice the difference. Nugenics Total T is the number one selling testosterone booster at GNC. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total T when you text college to 231231. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo their most powerful fat incinerator ever with key ingredients to help you get back into shape fast, absolutely free. Text college to 231231, 231231, text college. Okay, we're talking Syracuse, Virginia here on Locked On Syracuse. It is your Thursday episode. We're here with Mike, or excuse me, Greg Madia, my bad, uh, of the Daily Progress. Uh, so we talked quarterback, we talked wide receiver, we even talked a little bit of coordinators and coaches and whatnot. Let's talk that running back room, an interesting running back room. You've got the number one back in Paris Jones that is 5'8", 180 pounds, guy played corner last year. Uh, and then you have Xavier Brown, who in last game against Old Dominion rushed nine times for 88 yards, 9.8 yards per carry. What can you tell us about this running back room? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a three three man group, I guess you could say. Jones is the solidified starter, the senior, uh former walk it really is a good story. Former walk on uh, has worked his way into the top job after after not really carrying the ball much at all in his career. He had more he had more years of experience at Virginia than carries heading into this season. So that, that kind of tells you with where he's been on the depth chart in years past and what they've had to do. Like you said, played corner last year. Uh, so he's really a nice story for Paris Jones uh, to win that job. And then Mike Hollins is also in the mix. You'll see him. He's more of a downhill type runner. Uh, he'll, he'll be he'll be in the mix some, but he fumbled the ball inside the five-yard line last week. Uh, so, so we'll see if, if it's him or Brown uh, that is that is second in the pecking order this week. Brown's a freshman, and uh, he, I think he's really surprised the coaching staff with how how quickly he's been able to understand and comprehend everything they've asked him to do. Uh, so he's in the mix. And then uh, there are some other players uh, that could factor in. Cody Brown, a transfer from Miami, uh, has, has been kind of working, learning, trying to f- figure out exactly what the offense is. And Ronnie Walker, uh, who had a really good spring up until his injury, is is still working back from that injury. But he's dressed uh, each of the last two games, so maybe he gets a touch here or there uh, come Friday night. I I look at this team, and I you know I remember the the sort of air raid approach when you look at you know Robert and I, Jason Beck there last season. This year, 
there's a new sort of run heavy approach, it seems, from Tony Elliott. How has that shift sort of worked and what have you seen and how is that? I guess, you know, you're sort of starting to see Brennan Armstrong as more of a runner, too, as he seems to get his fill as well outside of that running back room. Yeah, they, they wanted to move to a more balanced approach, uh, like, like I kind of talked about with the percentages last year. Yeah. God, they were so throw heavy. Uh, but you have to take some pressure, I think, off the quarterback to make a play that often. right? You need something to complement uh, the passing game. And uh, a lot of their passing concepts come off play action and I think they've been there's been some opportunities there uh, for for big plays, and I think that's part of it that they feel Armstrong uh, can can really make make people uh, make opposing defenses hurt uh, with the play action game. But the running game, uh, it's been a work in progress. You got two different backgrounds of, of running styles with Kitchings and Elliott. They're trying to merge it together. Uh, I think it eventually will work, but there are some still things that that need to be worked out. Uh, Jones has been pretty good. Uh, but, but beyond that, they're, they're still looking for, for a little more consistency. Uh, maybe Brown's the guy to provide them that. But I think overall, they're happy with the balance they've achieved. I think they were over they were over 200 rushing yards against Old Dominion. They were over 200 rushing yards against Richmond. Really struggled to run the ball against Illinois, though. And that's, that's probably their concern heading into this week with, with what Syracuse can do defensively and the challenges uh, the Orange present. Last week, heading up and, and getting ready for the Purdue game, we were asking about how is Purdue going to combat the noise in the Dome? And the reporter we spoke to, Mike Carmen, was telling us that the Boilermakers were practicing with speakers blaring right next to the huddle and practicing their silent count and whatnot. Has Virginia done anything similar, or are they just going to take the, the Dome noise head on? Yeah, they they they've got the the orange, the Syracuse fight song, blasting over and over in practice. Oh, I over. love that. That's awesome. <laughs> That's <great>. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's a Tony Elliott staple. He did it a couple weeks ago for the first time uh, before UVA went to Illinois, and you could hear the fight song like as you were driving toward the practice field. Like I had the oh radio, I had the radio on. I was listening to a uh, sports talk show, and I was like, "What the hell is playing in the background?" <laughs> I rolled down the window. It's the practice field and, and uh, you know, the, the fight song that was playing. So they got the orange fight song playing this week. They got the train sound effect uh, over the speakers as well uh, that they play up at the Dome. So, oh, yeah. And he's been there, right? Tony Elliott's had some experiences up at, up at Syracuse with, uh, with Clemson. Uh, so he's no stranger to it. Though Virginia hasn't played there. Uh, you look at this team; they, they don't have many many players at all who have played at the, the car. Or, excuse me, the JMA. <laughs> I'm gonna call it myself there, but uh, I think Anthony Johnson, their cornerback, he was at Louisville before transferring to UVA. He's been there. Uh, Chico Bennett's been there, uh, who started his career at Georgia Tech. Though I think that game was during a pandemic year, so no fans. Uh, so it's really a new a new test for Virginia for this group. Uh, so I think they're trying to learn as much as they can from Elliott about it uh, and some other people who are at Clemson, too, that are on staff, uh, you know, strength coaches, you know, some, some personnel people behind the scenes uh, about what that test is like. Yeah, last time Virginia football was in the Dome was 2005. Uh, so it's yeah. been some time for sure. Uh, what else have you sort of heard – this week, whether it's from players, whether it's from coaches, sort of about the Syracuse preparations, uh, any concerns or focal points that you've heard, or just sort of what has that conversation been like leading up to this game on Friday? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, they got to tackle Sean Tucker. I mean, that's what the defense has been talking about. They, there's a lot of respect there for Tucker. I mean, he's a heck of a he's a heck of a running back over 14. I mean, I don't have to run the stats. You guys know him over 1,400 yards on the ground yeah. last year, like. You just – you don't see that type of player all that often. Virginia saw a really good running back week two uh, at Illinois and Chase Brown, who I think is still leading the country in rushing yards. Uh, but Tucker, he, he's he's phenomenal. And, and his reputation in the ACC, even though Virginia hasn't seen Syracuse since, since 2015 and the teams have totally changed over since then, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a really strong reputation that they understand. And I think 
Uh, when, when you look at their offense, what Schrader can do running the football has to scare you a little bit because it evens things up in the numbers games and, and really makes it tough for opposing defenses. And Virginia's run defense, uh, pretty good in, in two games against Richmond and against Old Dominion, but not so great at Illinois. Uh, so that, uh, that they can stop the run against an opponent that, that wants to run the football. I'll take one more quick ad break here to tell you about Bet Online. It's your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all of the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week's games. Bet Online is also your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. Wrapping up shop here, Matt Bonaparte and Valentine, Greg Madia on the show with us today. Uh, so we talked about how they're going to get ready for the noise. We talked about who they have to tackle, what they're worried about on the offensive side, everything like that. Going back to Virginia for a second, what is one aspect of the game, or maybe multiple aspects of the game, if you're feeling generous, that you think the country and maybe Syracuse especially is going to underestimate about Virginia coming into this game? I think it's Virginia's pass rush. I think their defensive line is much improved. Uh, from from last season, uh, you look at what they did through the transfer portal during the offseason, uh, bringing in Cam Butler from Miami of Ohio, uh, who was a three-time All-Mac player, bringing in Jack Camper, a defensive end from Michigan State, uh, defensive tackle Devontae Davis from South Carolina, and Paul Akiri from Columbia at the FCS level in the Ivy League. Uh, those four is, have really bolstered Virginia's depth up front. Butler is is a, is a starter and, and a heck of a player, and he and Chico Bennett each have gotten to the quarterback uh, the last two weeks. They both have two sacks. Uh, Aaron Famui, uh, returning player, has done a nice job on the interior of the front along with Jameer Carter. I think that defensive line is, is probably not getting enough credit, and the way they can get to the passer, I think you're seeing their pass rush improve one week to the next, at least – at least that's been my take through the first three weeks of the season is they're starting to get there. And I think they can create some pressure uh, on Garrett Schrader should Syracuse get put in some third and, and, and longs. Uh, similar question, not exactly uh, that similar, I guess, uh, but it's just going to talk about in general uh, what your thoughts are with regards to what is something maybe you talked about it already in the O-line, maybe something outside of the offensive line that Syracuse could possibly exploit against this Virginia team? Is there something else that sort of stands out as a true weakness that they could take advantage of? I, I don't know if Virginia special teams is a weakness, but it's been a mixed bag. It's been, okay. it really, it's been a mixed bag for sure. Uh, they had a punt return that was fumbled uh, against Illinois that bounced into the end zone and the Illini jumped on it for a touchdown. Last week, they had a missed field goal that would have sealed the, the, the game uh, earlier ahead of Brennan Farrell bouncing back, redeeming himself with, with a game winner. Uh, so their special teams have kind of been a mixed bag. They got, they've, they've also had a, you know, a nice uh, kick return uh, to set up that game-winning drive last week. So it's been, it's been so up and down that you're like, what are you going to get from Virginia special teams? So I think that is an area, if, if Virginia is not consistent, uh, it can be hurt with. Syracuse plays Virginia Friday night inside the JMA Dome. Very exciting stuff. Greg, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, happy to join you guys. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for making Locked On Syracuse your first listen every day. Go get more on the ACC. Make Candace Cooper's Locked On ACC your second listen. She takes you around the ACC in 30 minutes. That's Locked On ACC. Owen and I, we will see you tomorrow.